So this is lecture 14. Uh, first, we have an announcement. Uh, we missed one class uh, between the midterm break and midterm exam, so we need to make up for it. How about the Saturday at 11 a.m.? Is that okay with everyone? Okay, so the Saturday 11 a.m. we'll have a makeup class. Uh, and hope you guys have started on the project. Are there any questions on the project? So you are likely to, if, if you have not started yet, I recommend that you start soon because last year when they did it, they ran into uh, minor issues not related with the project itself. They had convergence issues in the tool, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the faster you can figure out all these, uh, the sooner you will be actually able to work on the project. So I recommend starting on the project as soon as possible. Okay. So now, uh, when we last discussed about the noise and power spectral density, et cetera, there were a lot of questions. So I thought maybe we can look at this uh, power spectral density of a random process from the perspective of signal processing. So let's say I have a random process. Let's say it's given by some X of T. Now, random processes can be classified into two types. It could be stationary, or it could be a non-stationary process. What does it mean to say that X of T is stationary? Its statistical properties will be time invariant. Right. So statistics are time invariant. Now a stationary process is sometimes further divided <laughs> into strict sense stationary and wide sense stationary. So white sense stationary is abbreviated as WSN. Now, if a process is strict sense stationary, it means that all these statistical properties are time invariant. If it is white sense stationary, then two statistical properties are time invariant. And those are the mean and the autocorrelation. So mean is time invariant. So the definition is expectation of X of D. This is the mean given by mu x of t, but this is time invariant, so I can drop the t and directly write it as mu x, okay? And then autocorrelation is time invariant, so this is given by rx of t1, t2. This is expectation of x of t1 into x of t2. Now, if this is time invariant, what it means is that I could choose T1 and T2 such that the T2 minus T1 is a constant. Now, if I translate this on the time axis, the autocorrelation will not change. So basically, autocorrelation is now a function of T2 minus T2, only the difference between the two. So this is often written as Rx of tau. So this is expectation of X of T into X of T plus tau. So this tau is sometimes called as the lag variable. Okay, so now let us consider a WSS, a white sense stationary process X of T. Now I can calculate its Fourier transform given by X of F. Okay, now what does Parseval's theorem tell us? The energy in X of T which can be calculated as x of t mod square integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dt will be equal to integral of minus infinity to plus infinity mod of x of f the whole square df. Okay. So now let's say instead of observing this x of t for all time, I observe x of t for a limited time interval from minus t by 2 to plus t by 2, okay? 
So now I am observing x of t for a small time interval. Now, once I have this new x of t for a small time interval, I can, of course, calculate a Fourier transform for that signal. So now let me represent this as x t of f. Now the energy in this signal will be given by integral minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 x of t the whole square dt. Okay. And this will be equal to integral minus infinity to plus infinity mod x t of f the whole square into df. Okay. So now let's say I divide both by t. Now, what is this quantity equal to? This is equal to the average power in the signal. Okay, so this is the average power of x of t observed for that limited duration. So now if you look at the RHS, <coughs> we have this quantity, which when we integrate over frequency is giving us the average power in the signal. Okay, so this is with respect to frequency and this quantity then has to be some sort of density function. Correct, you have a density, power density function. If you integrate it, you should get the average power, right? So this is how the uh, concept of power spectral density was theoretically derived. So the exact definition for PSD given by S X of F, because we are dealing with X of T is, so we have the signal X T of F, the whole square by T. I look at its expectation and then I tend this T to infinity. Okay, so this is the definition of the power spectral density. Now we saw the intuition behind the intuitive field for PSD, which is wherein you take a noise source, then you pass it through a one hertz bandpass filter and you observe the power in that one hertz uh, bandwidth around some F0. And then you sweep this F0 from zero to infinity or whatever range you require. So that will give you the power spectral density as a plot. Now this is the definition for that. So now what wiener kinsin theorem tells us is that what this theorem tells us is that this above limit exists for a wide sense stationary process. So if X of T is a wide sense stationary process, the above limit exists. And what is the second part? This is what you, will, you are likely to remember. Fourier transform of autocorrelation function, yes. So the PSD, the above limit exists and the value is equal to Fourier transform of Rx of tau. Okay. So now we saw that the autocorrelation for a white and stationary process is time invariant, which I can take its Fourier transform and calculate its power spectral density. And that power spectral density can be well characterized because the autocorrelation is now not varying with time. Okay. So what comments can you make about R X of zero? So this is equal to expectation of, you can look at the definition of expectation and then tell me. This will be equal to X of T square. Okay. What does this signify? This will be equal to the average power in the signal. Okay, so can I also write this as RMS square? 
right? Basically, I calculate the root mean square of x of t and then take the square that gives us, gives me the average power in the signal. And this is equal to, so I have x of t square. I integrate this and take the mean and then I take the square and then I can take the square of this. So basically the square root goes in, right? Okay, so now let's say expectation of x of t is equal to zero, meaning it is a zero mean function. It's a zero mean process. Then what is the relationship between? So if we have a zero mean process, what is the relationship between average power and standard and variance? They will be equal, right? So if you have a zero mean process, then the average power given by Rx of zero will be equal to the variance. So a lot of noise signals that we deal with are zero mean process. Okay, which is why you will interchangeably use the term power and variance. So this is true only when the mean is equal to zero. Is this clear? Okay, so then uh, we had a small confusion so if PSD, I could completely determine PSD, then couldn't I also determine the X of F? Why would this be time varying was one of the questions you had asked, right? So if I know PSD, what I know is basically mod of X of F, the whole square, from which I can calculate mod of X of F, right? But Fourier transform as such is basically a complex function. If I look at its values, it will have both real and imaginary parts. Or in other words, I have both magnitude and phase information, right? From PSD, I can only get the magnitude information. I don't have this angle information, which is why I cannot completely determine the Fourier transform from the PSD. And because I don't have the angle information, so I get only the magnitude information. I can't reconstruct the time domain signal, right? So now I could either deal with PSD or the absolute uh, magnitude of the Fourier transform. And it turns out it is much more easier to deal with PSD because the properties that we are interested in, the properties uh, of a noise signal that we generally deal with are going to be its average power or the mean, correct? Now, just by looking at the magnitude of the Fourier transform, it is not giving you any other additional info. So if you are interested in the average power, might as well deal with the PSD. Okay, then it turns out thermal noise, is this a, a, what kind of process is it? Is it stationary, non-stationary? So this is a white sense stationary process. Okay, any comments on flicker noise? So it turns out, Flicker noise is actually a non-stationary process, but some authors have shown that its autocorrelation function is almost stationary under certain conditions. And in this way, the general practice is to treat flicker noise as a stationary process, and then as a white sense stationary process, and then do the calculations as if it is a white sense stationary process. And for most cases, it yields the uh, results that match with uh, practical measurements, right? But you have to keep in mind that it is a non-stationary process. So if at some point in your research, if you see that the values are not matching, maybe you need to look into the theory a little bit more for that particular case. Okay, uh, any questions? Now, another question I had uh, gotten in the last class was how do simulators handle the PSD? Uh, I mean, how do they do the noise simulations? So we talked about how we can calculate the output uh, noise power spectral density when it is part of a system. So we look at the input noise power spectral density. We calculate the transfer function from the input node to that output node. 
and then we multiply the noise PSD with the magnitude square of that transfer function. So the simulators also do the same thing. Whatever we have done in hand calculations, they solve it using matrices. The uh, PSD of all the devices are well modeled. They are part of the model files. So they simply calculate the transfer function from input to output and repeat the same calculation. Okay. Now, if you are, so there is this very nice lecture by Professor Ali Hajmiri on the derivation of thermal noise. So he derives this from very basic principles and it's quite easy to follow. So if you search for uh, Ali Hajmiri thermal noise, it will come up on YouTube. So those of you who are interested can look into this. <laughs> so any other questions on this? Okay, so then we move on to theory on jitter and phase noise. Okay, so I'll start with a small recap so that uh, we can make sure the basics are all set right. So let's consider an ideal clock. So my clock signal is given by some V of T. This V of T, let's say is equal to some A sine of omega naught T. Etc. So this is time domain. Here we have V of T. This is T naught. This is to t naught zero. So here t naught will be equal to two pi by omega naught. Right? I can also define an f naught as one by t naught. Okay. So this time period is basically t naught, and we expect the same time period to occur from one cycle to the next, and we have defined one period. We are basically looking at the zero crossing points of the signal. We are calling zero volt as a threshold. Now I can plot the total phase. So time and this is phi of t. And this is going to be linearly increasing like this over a period time t naught. this would have accumulated by two pi. Now I can also look at the signal in the frequency domain. So let's say I took its Fourier transform. So X axis is frequency, this is zero. Now, this signal basically has only one frequency. It's a sinusoid. So if I plot its Fourier transform, I will have two impulses at F0 and minus F0. This will have a value A by 2J. And this will have a value minus A by 2J. So this is V of F. Now, I can look at the magnitude of V of F. So this will be A by 2. And this will also be a by two. Now I can also calculate the power spectral density for the signal. Right? Power spectral density is more relevant for noise signals for random processes, but there is no harm in calculating it for a deterministic signal as well. So then I could calculate its power spectral density as either a two-sided PSD or as a one-sided PSD. So if I calculate it as a two-sided PSD, so I'm looking at SV of F. So corresponding to F0 and minus F0, I'll have the values A square by four, 
and this is also a square by 4. To get the one-sided PFT, I have to fold the negative, time axis, uh, negative frequency axis onto the positive frequency axis. So I'm folding along the y-axis. So this is F corresponding to F0. Now I have the value A square by 2. Does this make sense? If you have a sinusoid with value, with amplitude as A, what is the power in that signal? That is equal to A square by 2. That is what you see here. And also, because we have an oscillation at exactly at F0, we expect all the power to be at F0 and at not any other frequency. So you will have an impulse at F0 and 0 at all the other points. Clear? OK. So now let me copy this. And now we'll look at a jittery clock signal. So now let's say we are looking at a real clock given by B of t is equal to A sine of omega naught t plus phi n of t. So this quantity phi n of t is called as phase noise. In some places it is called as excess phase. And I have also seen the term noisy phase being used to describe this. So we will stick with the terminology phase noise. Now in the presence of this phase noise, the zero crossings of the sine wave will now be shifted. Okay, which means <laughs> the total phase will now have some variation over it. So for example, at this point, the signal is advanced, which means you will have a larger phase here. And then here it is delayed, so phase is smaller, et cetera. And then it remains delayed. Okay, now I can, of course, directly plot this small phase noise. So this is phi n of t. And that will have a plot like this. Okay. And if I have phi n of t, I can, of course, look at its PSD. And let's say the PSD has some shape like this. Okay. So now this phi n of t could be either a deterministic signal, <laughs> it could be periodic or it could be random. That depends on what is causing this phi n of t in the first place. Let's say some periodic signal got coupled to the power supply. And because of that, our oscillation frequency is now, uh, because of that, this phi n of t, there is a periodic phase noise here. So if you know the magnitude of the signal that is getting coupled to the supply line, you will also be able to calculate the transfer function from that supply line to the output of whatever is generating the frequency for you. So in that case, it is a very deterministic signal. Now, if it is caused due to random processes such as thermal noise or clicker noise, then it will not be deterministic. It is a random process. So then you deal with the PSD. So let's assume that we are dealing with a random process and say we are looking at the PSD. So this is about phi n of t. What comments can you make about the PSD of V of t now? So when everything was ideal, the PSD of V of t looked like this, right? Let's look at the two-sided PSD. So now there is some jitter involved in the signal. Let's assume that the jitter value is small. The, uh, the zero crossing points have shifted and the time period is not same from one cycle to the other. Maybe this time period is some T1. This is T2, etc. On an average, this is still equal to T0. Let's say we have a reasonable clock. 
but all the cycles do not have the same t not as the period so what do you think will happen to this uh, power spectral density of this voltage it will spread around f not is that okay <laughs> Ah, so the uh, you can't say that it will be Gaussian. That spreading around will depend on the characteristic of S phi of it, right? But it will spread around because on an average the signal still has T naught time period, that is F naught frequency. So you would expect to see most of the power still at F naught, but then instantaneously the frequency is shifting around F naught. So there needs to be some power around F naught as. <coughs> so instead of seeing. So we are looking at the two-sided PSD. So instead of seeing two impulses, you would see so at F naught and minus F naught, you will see some waveform, uh, you will see some power with this distribution, some uh, skirt around F naught. Okay. And like I said, the shape of this skirt, the value of these uh, points will actually depend upon S phi of f through some relation. We'll see the detailed derivation a little later. But is this clear? Okay. So now we are going to look at both jitter and phase noise in detail. But jitter is basically a discrete time process. You can define jitter only when there is an edge. It could either be a rising edge or a falling edge. And you talk about how the clock edges have shifted with respect to the ideal edges. Correct? Which means I cannot define jitter continuously over time. I can define it only when there is an edge. Now, depending on the application, you might define it with respect to the rising edge or falling edge. Let's assume that we are interested in rising edges. Whereas phase noise, phi n of t, is a continuous process with respect to time. Okay, so when we deal with jitter, there are several definitions for jitter. So let us look at them one by one. <coughs> the easiest definition has been the one that we have used so far, wherein we simply talk about the absolute displacement of the real edge with respect to an ideal edge, right? So. This is called as absolute jitter. So let me now consider two clock signals. Let's say I have some clock signal clock one, which is jittery. And let's say I have an ideal clock. Okay. Now I can measure the displacement of the real clock with respect to the ideal clock. So let's say these edges are happening at zero, T, 2t, etc. Let's say these are occurring at t1, <coughs> t2, t3, etc. Then I can measure this displacement and let me represent it as a1. So similarly, there is some a2 here. There is some a3 here, etc. So now I have a sequence given by A1, A2, A3, etc. So this is a discrete time. Random sequence, which I have represented using the term A. And this is called as absolute jitter. So we'll represent absolute jitter using the letter AK, where K stands for the index. Right, because now this is a sequence, which means I can plot it like this. So K is the index, 
and I can plot my a k here. So when k is equal to zero, I'll have some value. K is equal to one, <coughs> I'll have another value, etc. Okay. Can you give me an expression for a k in terms of t k and the time period? <laughs> so what is a1 t1 minus 0 what is a2 t2 minus t let's say ak can take positive and negative value so if i generalize it to a kth value of a this will be Tk minus k times t. Okay, so a minor nuance here is related to how you would position your ideal clock. So instead of positioning this ideal clock like this, I could have also positioned the clock, say, here. Right? What would happen to the values of AK? <coughs> All of them will now increase by the same value, right? So now how do you how do you think we should position this ideal clock? Such as the huh. so the idea is that we are interested in how much this edge is varying, correct? So we are not interested if all the edges are varying by a constant delay, a constant offset, because then we'll simply say that the clock has an offset, right? It's not like the clock edges, edges are varying around each other, okay? So we are interested in how much these edges are varying around each other. So we are basically looking at a zero mean process. So you would position this clock such that if you take the mean of all these Oh, you would position this clock such that if you take the mean of all the a case, it would be equal to zero. Is that clear? Or another way to think about it is you position the clock wherever you want. What? You position the clock wherever you want, and then you calculate all the a case. You calculate the mean of a case. If it has a finite mean, subtract that mean from all the a case. Is that clear? Okay. So here we have compared one clock with an ideal clock. I can repeat this with a clock and another clock, right? And that is called as relative jitter. So this is the second jitter def definition. So I have a clock one and I have another clock, clock two. So let's say these are the edges of clock one and these are the edges of clock two. So now I could define, okay. so I can define a sequence consisting of the displacements between these edges. So I can call this as R1, this is R2, etc. So now I have a sequence, again, this is discrete time, and it is a random sequence of R1, R2, R3, et cetera, with the kth term being Rk. So we'll represent the relative jitter using Rk. And the kth term is given by Tk of clock two minus Tk of clock one, where Tk represents the, so this will be T1, of clock. Right? TK represents the position, the ab, uh, absolute time instant at which the clock edges are happening. So now here is a question for you. <coughs> so you can assume that clock one has absolute jitter represented using AK of CK1. Clock two has absolute jitter represented by AK of CK2. So calculate 
the relative jitter r k for between clock one and clock two in terms of absolute jitter. What do you get? So this will be equal to AKCK1 minus AKCK2. Now, whether you do uh, CK1 minus CK2 or CK2 minus CK1 depends on you. As long as you follow the same convention throughout, it will be fine. Okay. So, so far we have been comparing, uh, we have been comparing how the edges of a clock have been shifting with respect to another clock, either an ideal clock or a, another uh, real clock. Now, what happens if we compare how the edges are shifting within the same clock, right? So this thought process gives us a jitter definition called as the period jitter. This is represented using PK. So let's say I have a clock. So let's say these edges are T1, T2, T3, etc. So now let's say this time period is T1 and this T1 will be given by T2 minus T1. This will be some time period T2 and this is given by T3 minus T2. So for an nth time period, I could look at Tk, Tk plus one minus Tk, right? But can I use this as my uh, jitter uh, quantity or do I need to do something to make it zero? If I look at the mean of all the Tk plus one minus Tk, what would be that value? it will be equal to the ideal time period, right? So if I'm only interested in the variation, I might as well subtract the mean from it, right? So I can do minus T. <coughs> so this is the definition of the period jitter. Now, if you don't know what the ideal time period is, you observe it for a long time and find out what is the mean time period and subtract it from there. Now I can represent the period jitter in terms of absolute jitter. Can you try? Tk plus one minus Tk minus the time period. This is period jitter. I didn't follow the question. Okay, so here we have looked at one cycle and then we calculated the period jitter. So if I can define this for one cycle, I can also define it for two cycles, three cycles, etc. Right? So that brings us to the next next jitter definition, and this is called as n period jitter. So represented as PK of N. So if I take a clock signal, so this is T1, T2, T3, T4, etc. Let's say the time periods are capital T1, capital T2, capital T3, etc. Now let's say I'm looking at three periods at a time. So then the three period jitter, so I'm looking at the first value, k is equal to one, is given by t1 plus t2 plus t3 
to make it zero mean what should i subtract minus 3t this can also be given as t4 minus t1 minus 3t so what is the general expression for pk of n so let's first make this into a general expression so this will be summation of ti where i goes from k to k plus n minus 1 minus n times t or i could write this as t k plus n minus t k minus n into t <laughs> so now what definition do you think is missing what other jitter definition can you think of so i could compare the time period of one cycle with the time period of the next cycle right so this is called as cycle to cycle jitter and it's represented using cck so let me directly use generic terms let's say this is tk <coughs> and this is t of k plus 1 then cck is given as t k plus 1 minus tk Okay. so these are some of the definition if you look at the literature you will find that there are more jitter definitions because one side do cycle to cycle jitter i could take n cycles at a time and then calculate n cycle to cycle jitter right so there are more definitions but once you learn the basic terms and how they are defined you should be able to pick up anything else that you uh, come across so now there are these different definitions for jitter because depending on the application one or the other jitter might be more beneficial okay so now i will give you certain scenarios and maybe you can tell me what sort of jitter definition is more suitable okay so the first case i'm going to give you is let's say i pass a clock signal through a delay chain so i will get the same clock signal at the output but this delay chain is now going to add noise right so the output clock is going to be more jittery so to characterize this what sort of jitter definition should you use so i can use relative jitter because now we are dealing with two separate clocks one relatively clean clock and one jittery clock so now if you are running a simulation and if this was an ideal clock then you would call it as absolute jitter but if you are actually doing some measurement then it is a relative jitter but the idea is you compare both the clocks and the corresponding edges and of course you have to make sure that the jitter you finally obtain is zero mean in the sense that you subtract the mean value from all the edges okay so let's consider another example <laughs> let's say you are synthesizing a digital circuit so you have almost done synthesizing it and you are now looking at the static timing analysis so you are checking if setup time hold time etc are met so what jitter would you look at in the clock signal why cycle to cycle jitter hmm so what is the relevant parameter of a clock in a digital circuit if you were looking at whether setup time is met what property are you interested in of the clock ha huh, so what property so if let's say i synthesize the design and my setup time is not met 
what is the first thing that you think of what should you do to the clock increase the time period right okay so that is the clue so you can look at the jitter definitions and see what seems more appropriate So the answer is period jitter because when you are looking at the setup time constraint, you basically have one time period to uh, fix the clock to queue distribution delay, any combinational logic delay, and the setup time of the next clock, right? So with the period jitter, your period is now going to increase or decrease, right? And that will affect if you are able to meet the setup time or not. So period jitter is one of the jitters that you might be interested in. You will look at the worst case period jitter and make sure that the setup and hold times are met even under the worst case. Now, a lot of tools can also deal with absolute jitter. So you put in the information about how much an edge can vary, right? So this the tools generally call it as clock uncertainty. So if you say that the edges have an uncertainty of 50 picosecond, so when it is doing uh, the static timing analysis, it will delay the launching edge by 50 picosecond and it will advance the capturing edge by 50 picosecond. So that the period has reduced by so much. This is like the worst case equation. So you could be either looking at absolute jitter or period jitter, but the idea is to see how a period is, change, is changing. This is okay. So a third example. <laughs> so let's say I have a divider. I'll take the simplest case of the divider. Right? So if the input clock is this, the output will be a divided by two signal. So the period jitter of the output clock is basically n period jitter of the input clock where n is equal to two. Is that clear? So now if you want to find out, so this is of course assuming that the divider itself is not adding any noise, but anyways, the period jitter of the output signal is going to be worse than the n period jitter of the input signal where n you choose as the appropriate value depending on the divider ratio. This is okay. So if you're designing a divider and your clock already has a jitter, then the n a period jitter of the output, you can directly estimate. Uh, I mean, the minimum period jitter at the output, you can directly estimate based on the input n period jitter. So is, let's for a minute assume that the flop is not adding any noise, okay? So we are interested in what is the jitter, period jitter, how much the period is varying, right? Now, how does that relate to, relate to the input clock? So two periods here is going to become one period here. So if I look at the n period jitter, where n is equal to two, then I can find out the period jitter at out. Let's say I was dividing by 10. So then I would look at 10 period jitter at the input to find out the period jitter at the output. Is that right? Correct. So the jitter associated with that particular Correct. So if I'm interested only in the out, uh, rising edges, the jitter here and the jitter here will affect the output. Yeah. Uh, huh. So I talked about it uh, as the period in terms of the period jitter. 
Okay, so now depending on the applications, you will have to decide what jitter definition is useful, and then you can work with that jitter definition. Okay, so now a useful exercise to do is to see how all the jitter definitions that we saw so far relate to absolute jitter and period jitter. So we saw AK, absolute jitter, relative jitter, period jitter, N period jitter, and finally cycle to cycle jitter. So let's fill in this table. <coughs> For example, in this case, this will be AK of CK1 minus AK of CK2. Can you fill in the rest? So you can do this as a homework. We'll wrap up the lecture here. <laughs>